But when biologists look at this and try and nail it down and figure it out, try and make a guess, try and use heuristics to make a guess, like using the, the number of total bacteria lifetime as a measure of the number of total mutations we're playing with. The point is, from whatever angle you come at it, the, the answer is no, there has not been enough time. Tell us what intelligent design is that distinguishes it from some kind of effort to sneak God in by some back door. Sure. The clip that we're about to watch features a conversation between David Berlinski, Stephen Meyer, and David Galertner, who is a professor of computer science at Yale University. They're discussing Darwin's theory of evolution, and I know this is like a sacred cow that you're not supposed to mess with. I'll be real with you guys, this is my first time watching through this video. I just watched it and I was really surprised by a lot of the new mathematical uh, realities that are kind of contending against Darwin's theory. So I'm gonna stop talking now, play the clip out, play the conversation out. I'll give you guys some of my thoughts on the back end and some of the cognitive dissonance that even I was experiencing while I was watching this. So let's dive in and then I'll give you guys my thoughts on the back end. So the ratio of functional to non-functional is one over 10 to the 77th power. Okay, so functioning proteins are extremely rare. It's very hard to imagine random mutations leading to functional proteins, except that, and here I quote Dr. Galarenter again, but the theory understands that mutations are rare and successful ones even scarcer. Darwinism knows this. To balance that out, there are many organisms and a staggering immensity of time. Your chances of winning might be infinitesimal, but if you play the game often enough, you win in the end. Correct? That's the and theory. And that's the question. Do you play it often enough? There's always an often enough, and the question is, does the history of life with which Darwin was concerned uh, allow you enough chances to make it uh, at all probable, let's say, or even possible that you'll hit on, one, statistically, that you'll hit on one of those amazingly rare necklaces that folds up into a protein that can be stuck in a cell and actually doing, doing anything. I'm not a biologist, and so I look at this and say, yeah, there ain't, sure there's enough time. You know, there, there's been a lot of creatures on Earth, and life has gone on for a long time, but when biologists look at this and try and nail it down and figure it out, try and make a guess, try and use heuristics to make a guess, like using the, the number of total bacteria lifetime as a measure of the number of total mutations we're playing with. The point is, from whatever angle you come at it, the, the answer is no, there has not been enough time. The, the, the number of throws we've had is p too puny even to talk about. It doesn't even approach puniness. <laughs> And David. certainly is nowhere near reasonable. So, so we would get that if we had a reasonable time, but we don't. We didn't. We haven't. So let me just be very explicit for my little Winnie the Pooh bear-sized mind. You are saying, <laughs> you are saying that Darwin is unlikely to, have, to be able, it's unlikely that species arose the way Darwin said, or you are saying it is impossible. Darwin was just Mystic. Lovely man, beautiful idea. There's hardly a difference. <laughs> There's hardly a difference. Unlikely, impossible. We're talking about odds that are so prohibitive. If you wish to say it's impossible, fine. I'll defend you saying it's impossible. If you wish to say it's highly unlikely, I'll be in your corner as defense attorney as well. But there's no practical difference. It's look like we've known it about just these didn't things for way. hundreds of years. Right? You get a million monkeys at a million typewriters, all of them typing at random. We know they're not going to produce the collected works of Shakespeare in anything like a reasonable amount of time. It's like that wonderful episode of The Simpsons. Do you remember it? Mr. Burns has a million monkeys typing in a million typewriters. <laughs> they're going to produce the greatest novel ever written. He pulls out one sheet of paper and says, it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. You stupid monkey. <laughs> stupid monkey. <laughs> <laughs> or to, to put the discussion down even lower, the Jim Carrey film, where he's uh, uh, trying to get a date with a, a young lady he fancies, and she tells him to go away. He says, well, what are the, what are the odds a, a, a girl like me and a guy like you could get together? You know, not good. And he says, what do you mean, not good? Well, like one in a hundred? And she says, like one in a million. And then he says, well, but if there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! <laughs> I'm, 
I read you. Here's a precise way of, uh, of, yes. of, of yeah. cashing out this probabilistic argument. If you have 1 over 10 to the 77th power is your ratio, but then you have all, if every organism in the history of the planet, and we can estimate that, about 10 to the 40th organisms. So you define Bacteria, little bac tiny things, and, you know, everything. And, every and mosquito, every, those, every bacterium. Yeah, every time one of those um, replicates, there's a possibility for a mutation that could search right. the space of possibilities. So you've got 10 to the 40th possible mutations against a, a search space 10 to the 77th strong. Right. So if you do your exponential math, you end up with you can, what it means is you can search one ten trillion trillionth, one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the possible combinations. So in that case, are you more likely to succeed or fail? You're overwhelmingly more likely to fail to find one of the functional combinations, uh, even taking into account every organism that's lived on Earth. And that's, that, that means that the, the Darwinian hypothesis is overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. It just didn't happen. Okay, the, one last uh, piece of the argument here that you mentioned. There are other pieces in this book, of course, and in David's book. Um, but here's one last that, that you mentioned in your essay is compelling to you, David Galerner. To help create a brand new, and this is the, the, the question of mut mutations proving harmful at least as often as useful if I have it right, to help create a brand new form of organism, a mutation must affect a gene that does its job early and in the development of the life form and the, controls the expression of other genes that come into play as the organism grows. Evidently, there are a total of no examples in the literature of mutations that affect early development and the body plan as a whole and are not fatal. Somebody explain that one to me briefly. Uh, who wants to you, you, David, David? A good argumentative disjunction. If you talk about major changes, if they come late in development, they're not going to make a difference. The, the organism is already constructed. It may have Maybe more lavish eyebrows. Fur, right, okay. If they come early, they can't make a difference because inevitably they destroy the organism. Too many things downstream depend on those early exactly. cell divisions. So we're faced with a real destructive dilemma. Late, no good. Early, no good. Well, when? We've sort of exhausted the, uh, the possibilities. And I'm sure that David Galerner wants to stick up for Darwin one more time and say he couldn't have known this. <laughs> this is not an attack on Darwin as a man or a thinker or a scientist, but it's the job of science to figure out what guesses are right and what are wrong. Scientists are paid for making guesses, not for making right guesses, but for making interesting, plausible ones. And if scientists, after, after the guess has been made, don't do their job, don't investigate the guess, don't do their best to figure out is it true or false, then we are false to science and we're betraying science. All right. Intelligent design from David Galerner's essay. The evidence suggests to Meyer, who's seated with us today, that an intelligent designer must have been responsible. I can't accept intelligent design as Meyer presents it. Close quote. You also have seated next to you David Berlinski, who has been, who is, this is David, who has said that his attitude toward intelligent design, and I'm quoting him, is warm but distant. It's the same attitude that I display toward my ex-wives. <laughs> so, so you have one man who can't accept it, another man who definitely wants to keep his distance. <laughs> At least Meyer out. So, so well, I don't know, you want to start the easier case? Try to convince David? Tell us, what, tell us what intelligent design is that distinguishes it from some kind of effort to sneak God in by some back door. Sure, uh, the intelligent design. But, but parenthetically, yeah, just yeah, one yeah. word. Yeah. That's definitely not Steve's intention. In, in this book, in Intelligent Design, it's not a way to bring in a theological argument. It is a scientific approach, purely and absolutely valid, scientifically. One can agree with it or disagree with it, but one doesn't have to reject it insofar as theology making an illegal move, because that's not what he's doing. That's not what you're... Good. Yeah, let me just sketch the argument sure. briefly, and then we can just discuss it. Um, the, the, the big discovery of the 1950s and 60s was that the DNA molecule encodes information right. in a roughly digital or alphabetic or typographic form. This why, do you, was, why do you use the term digital? Well, because in computer science, we have characters, you know, zeros and ones. I see. I see. This, this, was, this is Crick, 1957, it's the sequence hypothesis. He realized that, that the information in DNA, or the, the, the 
chemical subunits of DNA called nucleotide bases were functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or like the zeros and ones in a section of computer code. It, that is to say, it's not, it wasn't their chemical properties that gave them their function, but rather their specific arrangement in accord with an independent symbol convention, which was later explicated in the form of what we call the genetic code. So we had genetic text functioning according to a code. So it really As, was a pure, it was, it was pure information. It, it, this is a genuine information storage system. Crick, by the way, was a code breaker in World War II. Oh. So th this is a fascinating, is an application of the information science system of molecular biology. Now what we, this is, and this is the argument that I make, is that what we know from experience is that information, whether we find it in a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or a information embedded in a radio signal or in a section of computer code, whenever we find information, and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. And what I do in the book, in Darwin's Doubt, and in my prior book, Signature in the Cell, is show that these uh, undirected evolutionary mechanisms that have been proposed as an explanation for the origin of information fail for various reasons. We've talked about the reason the Darwinian mechanism fails, because it can't search the space when it's so vast. The, the odds are overwhelmingly against it. So if we, if we, from a materialistic evolutionary standpoint, don't have any explanation for the origin of the information that's necessary to build new biological form. And yet we do know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, of a source of information, of a cause of the origin of information. That, that cause is intelligence or mind. And so what I've argued in both Darwin's Doubt and Signature in the Cell is that what we're seeing in life is evidence of the activity of a directing mind in the history of life. The only thing that we know of that creates information is mind, is intelligence. I find it to be extremely exposing of the bias against God when people will simply not look to mind as the as the cause for that effect of information, but rather have to try to come up with some type of a materialistic, naturalistic explanation for this amazing amount of complex information that exists even within the most basic cell. So I think that, again, when it comes to a conversation like this, we all sort of have our sacred cow, we all sort of have our own preferences and biases. I'll admit that mine is against evolution because of how evolution has kind of been used to try to discredit God within a historical context, even though that's been stretched intellectually beyond what it can actually support. But again, I'll admit that if the theory of evolution actually was proved to be true, if it was true, I would believe it. I, I, I want to believe what is true, and I hope you do as well. So no matter what side of this conversation that you're on, whether you're a Christian or whether you're an atheist, I think it's valuable to look at this, you know, theory from the 1800s and assess, is it holding up against time. And if it isn't, then we should reject it no matter if, if we're atheist or Christian. And if it is true, if, if it does uh, become more and more supported over time, then we should embrace it uh, regardless of where we stand. So I just think it's interesting because for whatever reason, evolution feels like one of these sacred cows that you can't question or touch or mess with. And um, I don't know, I find this conversation to be extremely interesting. I think the part about information inside of cells pointing toward mind, mind being the only thing that we know of that causes that level of coding and detailed information, I think that's also a clue. I think that's pointing toward an intelligent mind. Um, and I think that, again, intellectual integrity would cause us all, regardless of what our preferences or biases are, to consider these things, to actually be open-minded enough to be willing to follow the evidence wherever it may lead. So thank you guys for watching. As always, um, I might do some more from this hour-long conversation. I'll put a link to the whole thing in the description. I might do, do another kind of breakout from it um, as well. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye.